Hello again, here to read some more Harry Potter. We left Harry last time on the Hogwarts Express talking to Ron, thinking he was gonna be the worst in class. Let's see how that conversation goes. You won't be, there's loads of people who come from muggle families and they learn quick enough. While they had been talking, the train had carried them out of London. Now they were speeding past fields full of cows and sheep. They were quiet for a time, watching the fields and lanes flick past. Around half past twelve, there was a great clattering outside in the corridor and a smiling, dimpled woman slid back their door and said, Anything off the trolley, dears? Harry, who hadn't had any breakfast, leapt to his feet, but Ron's ears went pink again and he muttered that he brought sandwiches. Harry went out into the corridor. He had never had any money for sweets with the Dursleys and now that he had pockets rattling with gold and silver, he was ready to buy as many Mars bars as he could carry. But the woman didn't have any Mars bars. What she did have was Bertie Bott's Every Flavour Beans, Drubles, Best Blowing Gum, Chocolate Frogs, Pumpkin Pasties, Cauldron Cakes, Licorice Wands and a number of strange things Harry had never seen before in his life. Not wanting to miss anything, he got some of everything and paid the woman 11 silver sickles and 7 bronze nuts. Ron stared as Harry brought it all back into the compartment and tipped it out onto an empty seat. Hungry, are you? Starving, said Harry, taking a large bite out of a pumpkin pasty. Ron had taken out a lumpy package and unwrapped it. There were four sandwiches in there. He pulled one of them apart and said, She always forgets I don't like corned beef. Swap you for one of these, said Harry, holding up a pasty. Go on. You don't want this. It's all dry, said Ron. She hasn't got much time. He added quickly, you know, we're five of us. Go on, have a pasty, said Harry, who had never had anything to share before, or indeed anyone to share it with. It was a nice feeling sitting there with Ron, eating their way through all Harry's pasties and cakes, and the sandwiches were lay forgotten. Where... What are these, Harry? asked Ron, holding up the pack of chocolate frogs. They're not really frogs, are they? He was starting to feel that nothing could surprise him anymore. No, said Ron, but see what the card is. I'm missing Agrippa. What? Oh, of course, you wouldn't know. Chocolate frogs have cards inside them, you know, to collect. Famous witches and wizards, I've got about 500 and I haven't got a gripper or Ptolemy yet. Harry unwrapped his chocolate frog and picked up the card. It showed a man's face. He wore half moon glasses, had a long crooked nose and flowing silver hair, beard and moustache. Underneath the picture was the name Albus Dumbledore. So this is Dumbledore, said Harry. Don't tell me you've never heard of Dumbledore, said Ron. Can I have a frog? I might get a gripper. Thanks. Harry turned over the card and read, Albus Dumbledore, currently headmaster of Hogwarts, considered by many the greatest wizard of modern times. Professor Dumbledore is particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald, Grindelwald sorry, in 1945 for the discovery of the 12 uses of dragon's blood and his work on alchemy with his partner Nicholas Flamel. Professor Dumbledore enjoys chamber music and tenpin bowling. Harry turned the card back over and saw, to his astonishment, that Dumbledore's face had disappeared. He's gone! Well, you can't expect him to hang around all day, said Ron. He'll be back. No, I've got Morgana again, and I've got about six of her. Do you want it? You can start collecting. Ron's eyes strayed to a pile of chocolate frogs waiting to be unwrapped. Help yourself, said Harry. But in, you know, the muggle world, people just stay put in photos. Do they? What do they do? What? They don't move at all? Ron sounded amazed. Weird. Harry stared at Dumbledore, sidled back into the picture on his card and gave him a small smile. Ron was more interested in eating the frogs than looking at the famous witches and wizard cards, but Harry couldn't keep his eyes off them. Soon he had not only Dumbledore and Morgana, but Hengist the Woodcroft, Alberic Grunian, Circe, Paracelsus and Merlin. He finally tore his eyes away from the Drudus Cleonda, sorry for my pronunciations, who was scratching a nose to open a bag of Bertie Bott's Every Flavour Beans. 
You want to be careful with those, Ron warned Harry. When they say every flavour, they mean every flavour. You know, you get all the ordinary ones like chocolate and peppermint and marmalade, but then you can get spinach, liver and tripe. George reckons he had a bogey flavoured one once. Ron picked up a green bean, looked at it carefully and bit into the corner. Yeah, See? Sprouts! They had a good time eating the every flavour beans. Harry got toast, coconut, baked beans, strawberry, curry, grass, coffee, sardine and even brave enough to nibble the end of a funny grey one would Ron wouldn't touch, which turned out to be pepper. The countryside, now flying past the window, was becoming wilder. The neat fields had gone. Now there were woods, twisting rivers and dark green hills. There was a knock on the door of their compartment and the round-faced boy Harry had passed on platform nine and three quarters came in. He looked tearful. Sorry, he said, but have you seen a toad at all? When they shook their heads, he wailed. Oh, I've lost him. He keeps getting away from me. He'll turn up, said Harry. Yes, said the boy misery. Well, if you see him, he left. Don't know why he's so bothered, said Ron. If I bought a toad, I'd lose it as quick as I could. Mind you, I bought a scabber, so I can't talk. The rat was still snoozing on Ron's lap. He might have died, and you wouldn't know the difference, said Ron in disgust. I tried to turn him yellow yesterday to make sure him more interesting, but the spell didn't work. I'll show you. Look, he rummaged around in his trunk and pulled out a very battered-looking wand. It was chipped in places, and something white was glistening on the end. Unicorn hairs poking out. Anyway, he had just raised his wand when the compartment door stood open again. The toadless boy was back, but this time he had a girl with him. She was already wearing her new Hogwarts robes. Has anyone seen a toad? Neville's lost one, she said. She had a bossy sort of voice, lots of bushy brown hair and rather large front teeth. We've already told him we haven't seen it, said Ron. But the girl wasn't listening. She was looking at the wand in his hand. Oh, are you doing magic? Let's see them. She sat down. Ron looked taken aback. Uh, all right. He cleared his throat. Sunshine, daisies, butter, mellow. Turn the stupid fat rat yellow. He waved his wand, but nothing happened. Scabbers stayed grey and fast asleep. Are you sure that's a real spell? Said the girl. Well, it's not very good, is it? I've tried a few simple spells just for practice and it's all worked for me nobody in my family's magic at all it was ever such a surprise when i got my letter but i was ever so pleased of course i mean it's the very best school for witchcraft there is i've heard i've learned all our sets books off by heart of course i just hope it will be enough i'm hermione granger by the way who are you she said all of this very fast harry looked at ron and was relieved to see but by his stunned face that he hadn't learnt all his set books off by heart either. I'm Ron Weasley, Ron muttered. Harry Potter, said Harry. Are you really, said Hermione. I knew all about you, of course. I got a few extra books for background reading and you're in modern magical history and the rise and fall of the dark arts and great wizarding events of the 12th century. Am I, said Harry, feeling dazed. Goodness, didn't you know? I've found out everything I could if it was me said Hermione. Do either of you know what house you'll be in? I've been asking you around and I hope I'm in Gryffindor. It sounds by far the best. I hear Dumbledore himself was one. But I suppose Ravenclaw wouldn't be so bad. Anyway, we'd better go and look for Neville's toad. You two had better change. You know, I expect we'll be there soon. And she left, taking the toadless boy with her. Whatever house I'm in, I hope she's not in it, said Ron. He threw his wand back into his trunk. Stupid spell. George gave it to me. Betty knew it was a dud. What house are your brothers in? asked Harry. Gryffindor, said Ron. Gloom seemed to be settling on him again. Mum and Dad were in it too. I don't know what they'll say if I'm not. I don't suppose Ravenclaw would be too bad. But imagine if they put me in Slytherin. That's the house vault. I mean, you know who was in? Yeah, said Ron. He flopped back into his seat, looking depressed. You know, I think the ends of Scabber's whiskers are a bit lighter, said Harry, trying to take Ron's mind off his houses. So what do your oldest brothers do now that they've left, anyway? Harry was wondering what wizards did once they'd left school. 
Charlie's in Romania studying dragons and Bill's in Africa doing something for Gringotts, said Ron. Did you hear about Gringotts? It's been all over the Daily Prophet, but I don't suppose you get that with the muggles. Someone tried to rob the high security vault. Harry stared. Really? What happened to them? Nothing. That's why it's such big news. They haven't been caught. My dad says it must have been a powerful dark wizard to get round Gringotts, but they don't think they took anything. That's what's odd. Of course, everyone gets scared when something like this happens in case you know who's behind it. Harry turned his news over in, this news over in his mind. He, start, he was starting to get a prickle of fear every time you know who was mentioned. He supposed this was all part of entering the magical world, but it had been a lot more comforting saying Voldemort without worrying. What's your Quidditch team? Ron asked. Uh, I don't know any, Harry confessed. What? Ron looked dumbfounded. Oh, you wait, it's the best game in the world. And he was off explaining all about the four balls and the positions of the seven players, describing famous games he'd been to with his brothers and a broomstick he'd like to get. If he had the money, he was just taking Harry through the finer points of the game when the compartment door stood open again. But it wasn't Neville, the toadless boy, or Hermione Granger this time. Three boys entered and Harry recognised the middle one at once. It was the pale boy from Madame Malkin's robe shop. He was looking at Harry with a lot more interest than he'd shown back in Diagon Alley. Is it true, he said. They're saying all down the train that Harry Potter's in this compartment. So it's you, is it? Yes, said Harry. He was looking at the other boys. Both of them were thick set and looking extremely mean. Standing either side of the pale boy, they looked like bodyguards. Oh, this is Crab and this is Coyle, said the pale boy carelessly, noticing where Harry was looking. And my name's Malfoy, Draco Malfoy. Ron gave a slight <coughs> cough, which might have been hiding a snigger. Draco Malfoy looked at him. Think my name's funny, do you? No need to ask who you are. My father told me all the Weasleys have red hair, freckles and more children than they can afford. He turned back to Harry. You'll soon find out, find out some wizarding families are better than others, Potter. You don't want to be making friends with the wrong sort. I can help there. He held out his hand to shake Harry's, but Harry didn't take it. I think I can tell who the wrong sort are for myself, thanks, he said coolly. Draco Malfoy didn't go red, but the pink tinge appeared in his pale cheeks. I'd be careful if I were you, Potter, he said slowly. Unless you're a bit politer, you'll go the same way as your parents. They didn't know what was good for them either. You hang around with riffraff like the Weasleys and that Hagrid and it'll rub off on you. Both Harry and Ron stood up. Ron's face was as red as his hair. Say that again, he said. Oh, you're going to fight us, are you? Malfoy sneered. Unless you get out now, said Harry, before bravely then more bravely than he felt because Crab and Goyle were a lot bigger than him and Ron. But we don't feel like leaving, do we boys? We've eaten all our food and you still seem to have some. Goyle reached towards the chocolate frogs next to Ron. Ron leapt forward but before he'd so much as touched Goyle, Goyle let out a horrible yell. Scab as the rat was hanging off his finger, sharp little teeth sunk deep into Goyle's knuckle. Crab and Malfoy backed away as Goyle swung Scabbers round and round, howling. And when Scabbers finally flew off and hit the window, all three of them disappeared at once. Perhaps they thought there were more rats lurking among the suites, or perhaps they'd heard footsteps, because a second later Hermione Granger had come in. What has been going on, she said, looking at all the suites all over the floor, and Ron picking up Scabbers by his tail. I think he's been knocked out, Ron said to Harry. He looked closer at Stark Scabbers. No, I don't believe it. He's gone back to sleep. And so he had. You've met Malfoy before, Harry explained about their meeting in Diagon Alley. I've heard of his family, said Ron darkly. They were some of the first to come back to our side after you know who disappeared. Said they'd been bewitched. My dad doesn't believe it. He says Malfoy's father didn't need an excuse to go over to the dark side. He turned to Hermione. Can we help you with something? You'd better hurry up and put your robes on. I've just been 
up the front ask the driver and he says we're nearly there you haven't been fighting have you you'll be in trouble before we even get there scabbers has been fighting not us said ron scowling at her would you mind leaving while we change all right i only came in here because people outside are behaving very childishly racing up and down the corridors said hermione in her sniffy voice and you've got dirt on your nose by the way did you know Ron glared at her as she left. Harry peered out the window. It was getting dark. He could see mountains and forests under a deep purple sky. The train did seem to be slowing down. He and Ron took off their jackets and pulled on their long black robes. Ron's were a bit short for him. You could see his trainers underneath them. A voice echoed through the train. We will be reaching Hogwarts in five minutes time. Please leave your luggage on the train. It will be taken to the school separately. Harry's stomach lurched with nerves and Ron, he saw, looked pale under his freckles. They crammed their pockets with the last of the sweets and joined the crowd thronging the corridor. The train slowed right down and finally stopped. People pushed their way towards the door and out of the tiny dark platform. Harry shivered in the cold night air. Then... A lamp came bobbing over the heads of the students and Harry heard a familiar voice. First years, first years over here. All right there, Harry. Hagrid's big hairy face beamed over the sea of heads. Come on, follow me. Oh, more, any more first years? Mind your step now, first years, follow me. Slipping and stumbling, they followed Hagrid down what seemed to be a steep, narrow path. It was so dark either side of them that Harry thought there must be thick trees there. Nobody spoke much. Never the boy who kept losing his frog sniffed once or twice. You'll get your first sight of Hogwarts in a sec, Hagrid called over his shoulder. Just around the bend, dear. There was a loud, ooh. The narrow path had opened suddenly on the edge of a great black lake. Perched atop the high mountain on the other side, its windows sparkling in the starry sky, there was a vast castle with many turrets and towers. No more than four in a boat, Hagrid called, pointing to a fleet of little boats sitting in the water by the shore. Harry and Ron were followed into their boat by Neville and Hermione. Everyone in, shouted Hagrid, who had a boat to himself. Right then, forward! And the fleet of little boats moved off all at once, gliding across the lake, which was as smooth as glass. Everyone was silent, staring up at the great castle overhead. It towered over them as they sailed nearer and nearer to the cliff on which it stood. Heads down, yelled Hagrid as the boats reached the cliff. They all bent their heads and the little boats carried them through a curtain of ivy which had a wide opening in the cliff face. They were carried along a dark tunnel which seemed to be taking them right underneath the castle until they reached a kind of underground harbour where they clambered out onto the rocks and pebbles. Oi, you there, is this your toad? said Hagrid who was checking the boats as people climbed out of them. Trevor! cried Neville, blissfully holding out his hands. Then they clambered up the passageway in the rock after Hagrid's lamp, coming out at last to a smooth, damp grass right in the shadow of the castle. They walked up a flight of stone steps and crowded around the huge oak front door. Everyone here? You there? Still got your toad? Hagrid raised a gigantic fist and knocked three times on the castle door. Ooh, we'll see what happens in chapter seven. See you again soon. Bye.